guest with us. It's Hermela Aragawi. She's an independent Ethiopian American journalist and a part time community organizer and former journalist anchor for CBS News in Los Angeles. She also helped launch the hashtag No More as part of a global grassroots movement created to defend Africa and the African diaspora from U.S. imperialist exploitation. Hermela, welcome to the show. Good to see you. Jimmy, good to see you, too. It's been a long time. So I want to. So there was a last time we talked, there was a civil war happening in Ethiopia. And so there, but they uh, and of course, the way it was reported here in the West was always backwards. Um, but so there was a there's been a ceasefire. There's been a peace agreement. Right. So and yeah. this was from this was from May of 2022. OK, so I just want to let. The, yeah, the peace deal was from November. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, it's November. That says November, not May. So this, I just want to show people where it is so they know what we're talking about. Ethiopia is right here, right near the Horn of Africa. There's Somalia, Tigray, and then uh, Eritrea. I think I'm saying that right. Hey, look, there's Yemen. So um, Ethiopia sets out on a long road to peace after two years of war. Ethiopia's Tigrayan rebels start handing over heavy weapons. As peace begins in Ethiopia, Tigray opens up. Tigrayan protesters tell Biden Ethiopia peace accord falling apart and immediate action needed to stop 800 days of Tigray genocide. Hey, and uh, Eritrean troops endanger Ethiopian peace deal for two years. So tell me what's going on with the peace deal. Yeah. So, I mean, it looks like it's sticking as far as what um, everyone can see. So in November, the Ethiopian government and then these representatives from the Tigray People's Liberation Front, the rebels that had started this war two years ago in order to get back into power after their group fell from power uh, following 27 years of rule. So they two sides got together, sat at a table and actually came up with a peace deal in Pretoria, South Africa, which everybody was really happy about. Uh, and then they went to Kenya and they added some stipulations as to how the rebels, the TPLF rebels would disarm. They would only disarm if Eritrea leaves, if it does, these other regional forces leave and only the Ethiopian National Defense Forces can be in that region. So a lot of people were not happy with that, but it looks like slowly that they are disarming or they've claimed that they're disarming. The government has been very hush hush about whether this peace deal is actually, you know, happening um the way that it's supposed to it's certainly not happening the way that they said it would in south africa there were all these timelines about when the rebels would disarm and that's been those timelines have long been so this, uh, passed. so this is so the country of ethiopia has a new government the people who w want the old government they're the rebels and they're up here in tigray and they're what, what would you say would you call them terrorists or just rebels uh, right. I've been looking for a word. I mean, they're designated a terrorist organization by the Ethiopian government. And, you know, they say they don't sit down with terrorists, but they sat down with terrorists because these are not your just, you know, uh, average rebels. These they, they were a part of a group that was in power in Ethiopia from 1991 till 2018 uh, after six years of protests and different um, strategic efforts to take them down. So they're backed by the U.S. They were heavily armed. Uh, much of the uh, country's intelligence apparatus was controlled by them. Um, and so while they are designated terrorists, they still um, had to really sit down with this group because the U.S. was putting a lot of pressure on Ethiopia. And a lot of that's just economic pressure. You know, the, this, this U.S.-centered uh, unipolar world where um, these developing countries need to borrow from the IMF and the World Bank in order to reconstruct, particularly after conflict. And so it looked like the it looks like the Ethiopian government was making some concessions to the U.S. by sitting down with this group because they had made some serious gains militarily uh, against a group. And much of that was because of uh, drones that they were able to procure um, and the Eritrean uh, soldiers. Um, Eritrea really came through for Ethiopia. I mean, without Eritrea and the drones, um, I think signs point that this group would have been back into power. It would have been a coup. So just so you know, so the Ethiopian government had a, had, was at a civil war with the rebels from Tigray. They were the 
uh, leaders that were thrown out. They ruled it for decades. They ruled the country. And then they got thrown out in 2018. The rebels are all in Tigray. And guess who's backing the rebels is the goddamn United States government. So do you need to know who's the bad guy in this situation? Whoever the U.S. government is on the side of most likely are the bad guys. And that's exactly what happened. And so so they're supposed to hand over all their their guns and stuff. Is that happening? It's slowly happening. They still control. I've seen different percentages. They control about maybe 20 percent of part of the region. Um, And the reason that you're seeing some of the headlines about the Eritrean soldiers are still there, there are indications that they're actually leaving and, and going off to the border. The the reason that the a lot of the rebel leaders, including Geetha Charada, who's on Twitter, um, say that is so that they have a reason not to disarm. But certainly Ethiopia as a country and the region, the Horn of Africa region as a whole, will not be at peace if these people um, still have arms. I mean, they were on record, U.S. back in 1991 to overthrow the then uh, communist government at the time when they started this war two years ago. They're, to their calculus, they they were going to win. I mean, they had the like like I said, the intelligence apparatus, much of the the country's armament, and the diplomatic cover from the U.S. Um, so they, you know, they they thought they were going to win. I think there's factions of them that are still trying to hold on, and there is you know some concern among Ethiopians and Eritreans that they may restart a war. But as of now, things are moving forward, and that's a really big deal for for the region. Now, here's just an example of how. Poorly, the West reports stuff, right? So uh, in the West, we heard that the Tigray-based TPLF, the rebels, was rebelling against a government that was starving the people of Tigray into submission. So that's what the, the United States propaganda was that the Ethiopian government is now starving these people in Tigray. And that's why we have to help these people in Tigray. Uh, but here's the former uh, U.N. World Food Program director. And he says that's not true. And yeah. The you know, in a norm- in the book is that this was a politicization of the process, um, ostensibly to to put pressure on the government and maybe other actors, um, donors as well, to to raise um, um, funding, but also to to presumably facilitate. Now, the point that I say in the book, I mentioned the book, is that actually when we were not when we were not able to access, it has to do with violence. And when the moment came late in late in the year, um, when many of these assumptions for people dying of hunger presumably came to be, there was no evidence at all of famine, no evidence at all of people having died of hunger. So clearly there was another narrative that was at play and largely political, I would say. So that was all made up. That all made up, all made up. And you can watch. Thanks for playing that. You can watch that full interview on my YouTube channel, Hermela TV. But yeah, in a in a normal world where there was actual journalism happening on international news, this guy would be plastered everywhere. You know, on all the different outlets. I mean, for two years, they told not just the Ethiopian government, but Ethiopian people and Eritreans who supported. Uh, the government's effort to push back against these insurgents, that we were all wanting the people in Tigray to be starved to death and the government was using uh, starvation as a weapon, when in fact, as that uh, uh, guy, uh, as uh, Were Omamo says, he is the, by the way, UN World Food Program country director in Ethiopia from 2018 until the end of 2021. There is no one that is going to be a more credible source of information than this guy. He actually went around to different parts of Tigray, had people on the ground that he was checking with because they had satellite phones. It's not that everybody was not able to uh, communicate. And for two years, all these you know so-called journalists on Ethiopia told everybody that this government was starving people, that there were uh, people that were dying of hunger in the Tigray region when in fact they were not. And a lot of that, I believe, had to do with um, whatever they were trying to get in there. Maybe, maybe it was just, a like he says, a, a way to raise money uh, for the UN World Food Program to raise money every time they they say famine, they can just uh, collect a lot of money. But I think there's more sinister reasons as to why they needed this unfettered humanitarian aid to go into the Tigray region. And the reason I say that is there is history that these rebels 
use uh, this 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 starvation allegation in order to procure weapons. In the 1980s, there was this, you might remember, live aid fundraiser for Ethiopia. There were all these people that were, you know, starving in the, in the country under that communist government. And there was some truth to that. Uh, there were actual videos of people that uh, were hungry. After the world came together and raised $100 million with all these different artists from the U.S. and the West, these rebels used 95% of that money, according to a BBC report that they kind of got in trouble for, but that they stood by. They took 95% of this $100 million and bought weapons, and it changed the game for them. And they were able to overthrow the communist government within years and get into power. So this is a playbook that they have used before. So a lot of people don't question, if you see Ethiopia, famine and hunger, you sh we should question, how is it 30 years later that we're having the same conversation uh, about people starving in Ethiopia? It's not the reality. They were hoping to maybe procure more weapons this time and continue their war. And so that's what's so frustrating about the way we talk about human rights in the West and particularly in the United States. There are all these otherwise good people that just get the story so wrong. And I don't blame them because the wrong story is on CNN, ABC, CBS, all of them. And they think they know what's going on. And so they sign up on this rebel and terrorist narrative and, you know, pushing on that when the reality is really the reverse. So so uh, it's just it's it's just like a playbook 30 years later. And sadly, the the American public is so uneducated uh, about what's going on around the world that they end up on the wrong side of things. OK, you're talking about when I was a kid and they, and we are the world and all that came out and they're talking about Ethiopia. And I remember this very vividly at lunch. They teach you like, do you want to forego your fruit roll up and for 35 cents and set, give it to Ethiopia so we were yes. paying for guns with our fruit roll up money? That's yes. what we, wow. Yes, it's insane. <laughs> wow. And the U.S., I mean, this is, this, these are, you know, good uh, Americans that want to do right and feed these starving people in Africa. And, you know, they put out all this money. All these artists are the face of it. And most of that money went to weapons. We are affiliated with a 501c3 called We Are the 51%. This is based off of all the good people in the world giving extra effort to have a better way of life. You can donate, sponsor, or even make a tax-deductible payment to help these children to get food so no child goes to sleep hungry. How you can help is to go to our website, matt55.com. You go to the bottom right-hand corner of the video, then click the button that says Retail Customers. You can choose either option, the $5 or the $40 donation options, either click the add button below the dollar amount of which one that you choose. Then the next page, choose the quantity of the donation amount. For example, if you like to donate $1,000, then you can change the quantity amount to 200. Then click the checkout button in the bottom right hand corner. And then on the next page, enter your credit card information, name and address. We will send you out a receipt for the amount so you can write this off as a donation on your taxes or also on your business taxes. Remember, our main goal is $1 million to help sponsor 20,000 children. 1 million people in the world will lose their life due to starvation due to the famine that has already begun by 2025. In case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 